Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone again. I've got a couple of announcements here. They may be a little unorganized, so after announcements, I'm gonna go into the foyer, and if anybody has some questions on any of the announcements, come and see me. Um, with that, uh, there's a couple of announce, uh, dates to announce. The first one is um, next Friday, we're planning on taking the youth to a tubing at River Valley in, I believe it is St. Mary's, correct? Um, we're watching the weather closely. This week doesn't look too promising for it, but we're planning to go anyway. Um, so we have these little sign-up tickets that will be out front. For anyone that is planning on going, you'll need to follow the directions on it. And it's basically because of uh, COVID and whatnot so that you have to answer these questions. So if one person answers them for everybody, then that one is responsible for everyone. So we're just trying to make sure that everyone that is planning on going, please come and grab one of these. And if you can, sign up today so that we can get everything, most of it done today, if not by Wednesday. So if any of you have any questions, come and see me out in the foyer after. Um, again, that'll be, it's planning for this Friday. Since we've had such a, such a long break, we're trying to get a couple of these things in. And uh, as we can see, the weather is turning beautiful out there, so the snow won't last. Should that not happen, we're planning on doing just a fun night here at church on Friday. So either way, you guys can plan for the youth to have activities this Friday. Um, but should we be going to... Tubing, we're probably going to need some parents to volunteer to drive. We have a large youth this year again. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, if I'm missing anything, um, come and see me. Uh, Pastor Jake will probably be out there too if we need to answer some questions. Uh, the next date to announce is uh, Brotherhood Meeting, March 20th. I know the uh, announcement on the board said 7 p.m., but I believe it is 9 a.m., so please, all men, we're just requesting that anyone that has time um, to please come out. It's where we'll be electing the two new pastors. So again, that's March 20th, so not this coming Saturday, the Saturday after. And then March 21st, which is the Sunday following that, we're planning a soup and pie fundraiser. It'll be takeout and eat in, so there'll be 10 tables available. It's first come, first serve. $50 minimum for the table, and this is to fundraise for a youth bus that we're planning. Since we have such a large group to go to any events, we're having a hard time with, with finding and organizing rides. So the plan is to purchase a bus, if any of you are not aware of it. So again, this that'll be is planned for March 21st. And just a reminder, if you have youth, uh, just ask them what they're supposed to bring because they will most likely forget. So if you have youth here, just ask them, what are you supposed to bring for youth for the soup? So again, that's for March 21st, a Sunday, and we're planning on serving in the foyer for two seating. So the first one after the first service, um, I believe we had time set. I don't have the times for the seating, but that'll be announced next Sunday. But Sunday 21st, Sunday, March 21st, uh, 10 tables, $50 per table minimum, and that is soup and pie. If I'm missing anything, um, Mike can bring that up as well. Uh, prayer requests, there's a few here. Um, please pray for the Sawatsky family. So Mike's uh, father-in-law's brother passed away in Mexico, so please uh, lift up the family in your prayers as you think about them. And also uh, Peter Wall, he was the one that had back surgery a while ago. Um, and he was back home getting better, but he had a seizure either Friday or Saturday. So he is back in the hospital. So just lift up the Wall family as well. And the New Life candidates, um, if you think about them, they're going through a major, maybe a major change, or maybe they're just overwhelmed by the grace that God is, has for them. So just keep them in your prayers as well. And the Brotherhood meeting and the families of the nominated, keep them in your prayers as well, as again, that is a big change and a big responsibility. If I'm missing anything, like I said, with the youth fundraiser stuff, uh, come see me out in the foyer. I'll spend my morning out there for anybody that has any questions.
Today's text that I've chosen to read is out of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and I'm reading out of the ESV. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. With those thoughts, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, though a little unprepared, we just thank you for, for your, however unprepared we are, Father, you are gracious, you are sovereign, and you wait for us. So I just thank you for your sovereignty, I thank you for, for your work of salvation. That is something that we could never do, something we can never attain. So Father, I just pray that, that you even take that away from us, that we stop trying, that we just come to the cross and we look upon your son, whom you chose to do this work for us because you knew that we couldn't. So Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for for your love for us and your truths. Just remind us what those are. Remind us that you are always with us, that that you never leave us, you never forsake us. And Father, this morning, we just want to lift up all the hurting families. We want to pray this morning for the Sawatsky family who've had to say goodbye to a brother and a father. Father, we just pray that, that you be with the, father, or the Sawatsky family in this time of loss and grief. May you present yourself in a way that, that only you can. And help us as the church family to not shy away from a warm greeting and just help us, remind us to lift them up in our prayers to you and just to, for comfort. We also pray for the Wall family. We pray for Peter and his health. Father, may you, if it's your will, may you just grant him healing and may you just be with the family and, and grant them patience and, and long-suffering. It's a hard thing to to ask for, Father, but those are, those are fruits of the Spirit. Father, we thank you for the men who have left their name standing for the upcoming election. Father, may you just, again, work in them in a special way, the ones that you have already chosen. Father, may you just reveal yourself to them as well in a way that, that they know that this isn't about them, that this is about you. This is a work that you have Start it, and you will also complete it. Father, we also just want to lift up all these events that we are planning with the youth. We're planning, but we're also ready to, to change our minds. We just thank you for the opportunity that we have now again to, to plan some of these things. And Father, it is our desire that we're able to, to complete some of them, but our biggest desire, Lord, is to, to be obedient to you. I want to lift up Mike this morning. As he comes up here to share a message, may you grant his spirit words to speak and be with us, the hearers. Give us ears to hear and soften our hearts to hear what you have for us this morning. We give you thanks for everything that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning. Um, I'd like to greet you with a little bit of a, um, I'm not going to have much time today, but with a little bit of a lengthy greeting where Paul talks to 
or in his letter that he wrote to the church in Rome where he says, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and his holy scriptures concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace, the apostleship to bring about obedience of faith. That, that word, that phrase right there, to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles in his name's sake, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved in God in Rome, called as saints. To all who are beloved in God here in Sommerfeld, in Mount Salem, called as saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So diving in, the title of my service today is called Bronze Serpent. And uh, I still find myself in, in John chapter 3, and, and I've, been, I've just been riveted here in John chapter 3, and going through and seeing all these little tidbits. And it's still the conversation of Nicodemus with Jesus, and how Nicodemus came out at night secretly talking to Jesus and really just wanting something deeper. He's seeing something that's going on and he wants this thing to be deep. There, there needs to be a better meaning. Have you ever told a story about an adventure that you had? And the adventure, like, it was exhilarating. And, and you're telling this story and you're getting more and more enthusiastic because your listeners are just like... And, but you have so much passion because you remember what it felt like. And you were just like, have you ever experienced that? And they're like... No. And you're like, but it is so much fun, or it is so good. I don't know. Have you ever done that? Like, I know I've done that multiple times, and you guys know me as a little bit of a dramatic as I'm speaking. And it's just this, it's this scenario of they're not feeling what you're feeling. And you're just like, you know, really, you got to feel what I'm feeling. you got to understand what I'm trying to understand. This is where Nicodemus is with Jesus. And I, and I really, I, I got a huge confession to make to you this morning. I've, I've made light of, or I've, I've kind of called Nicodemus an idiot. Even, even Jesus thinking him as, as, as this stupid guy. Like, and he says there in John 3, you're a teacher, and you don't know this stuff? And, I, and, and I'm just, I have this humbling confession to make that I think I'm just like Nicodemus. I'm a teacher? I come up here once a month to teach you guys. And here I've been giving Nicodemus these jabs about how untrained or unknowing of the gospel he is. And Father schooled me as I was going through this service and preparing to share with you guys about the bronze serpent. I'm still digesting John chapter 3. I've been fast forwarding into 4, 5, and 6, and it's just been, it's been really amazing. I don't know where God is going with this. I didn't plan to start a series in the book of John, but I've been thoroughly, thoroughly impressed in, in my findings as Nicodemus is, is coming out. <laughs> and he's saying, well, good teacher, what must we do? And, and Jesus tells him, well, unless you be born again. And he's like, born again? That's like one of my favorite sayings. Must I re-enter my mother's womb? Like, come on, right? What is this guy saying? And then we, we fast-forwarded it. Well, not fast-forwarded. We rewinded back into Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. And, and where Jesus is actually referring to, and this is, this is a little bit of history. This is a little bit of knowing about how the Pharisees and the Sadducees taught back in that day was they challenged each other to see if they knew the scriptures. Just like that story that you're telling and this person hasn't experienced it and they're just kind of going, I I'm, I'm, just, I'm not feeling what you're feeling. Jesus is seeing this with Nicodemus and Jesus is talking about being born again and Nicodemus is like, I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus is like, man, alive, you're a teacher of Israel? And you don't know these things? And, and that's why we rewinded and look into Ezekiel 37, because I truly believe that's what Jesus was referring to about being born again. 
And then I find myself, my main text for today is John chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. And without further ado, I'm going to just dive into that um, and see if we can't plow through and get out of here in time for the cleaners to come in and be ready for the next service. So John chapter 3, verses 9 through 14, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version. It says this, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and we do not, and, and you do not accept our testimony. This is that story. This is you telling this exhilarating story, you actually experiencing something in life that you are just so thrilled and pumped about, and you're just like, have you ever? Can you believe it? I, I remember specifically a story of Isaac telling me about this little lake or pond he has up north, and he's like, we'll catch our limit every day. I'm like, I don't believe you. And he's like, man, I've gone there for years, and I do it every year. I'm like, I don't believe you. Okay, you got to come. Okay, I'll come. Still don't believe you. We get out there, and man, we catch fish. I'm like, this is unbelievable. He's like, I tried telling you, <laughs> right? I wonder how many of us are like that. How many of us hear the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and until we experience it for ourselves, we're not going to believe? And this is what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus right here. I can't even get through my text today. This is crazy. Nicodemus, is this what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Um, I I thank you for the opportunity again to come up and to speak literally what you are doing in my life and 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 humbling and and maybe it's a a, an awkward thing but I don't I don't want it to be awkward that I I am still just an unlearned man living through these steps of being a teacher and being, uh, being a minister within a congregation and just being just flabbergasted at what you are still teaching me. It is amazing. And, and here, you've given me the privilege just to share these amazing truths that you keep on revealing to me through your son. And that's why I opened in Romans. It's about the obedience of faith. That faith is faith in you, faith in being born again, faith in understanding that you have come and given us life. And I truly am uh, so blessed that we get to, that I get to stand here and just announce that faith, announce that, that life. And I pray, not because I'm smart, not because I've experienced something better, but I pray the experience of your life in every single person listening today. Not my experience, but just that they can seek your face. I pray that you soften their hearts, you open their ears, and you set my agenda aside, and that you may live in and through me the way that you see fit. Father, I confess my dependence upon you. May you live in and through me the way that you see fit. Your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here we go, breaking it down. Verses 10 through 12. Jesus is pointing out the fact that people can testify of what they have seen. And I already, I I dove into this already, sharing a story about um, about a fishing story. And there's so many other stories that people have told me, and I'm just like, yeah, I don't believe you. But they've actually lived it. So here's the really neat thing, is Jesus lived Ezekiel 37. He was there. 
And he's telling about these experiences. And Nicodemus is a teacher of Israel. Being a teacher of Israel means you know the Old Testament. When Jesus is making a reference to the Old Testament, you know what he is talking about. And Jesus is like, not, not Jesus, Nicodemus is like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, what do you mean this born again thing? And Jesus is like, man. And he talks about the wind. And then the wind is this direct reference of an earthly thing. And Jesus says to him, how am I going to tell you heavenly things and expect you to believe them if I can tell you simply of earthly things and you don't believe? Like, dude, give your head a shake. And, and, and again, here I am giving Nicodemus these jabs of being an idiot, being stupid. And then I find myself, oh man, I am, I am Nicodemus. I've, I've, I'm living in his shoes because there's so many times I come to God and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know what this means. And he humbly slows down, rewinds, and he brings to mind something that I can understand, and then we can begin to look and see um, what is happening. I believe, it's not in the text, but I believe Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in this way, in this, in this conversation where, where Jesus is bringing about all of these things and Jesus is always talking in the spirit. You can read later on in John, and Jesus says that, that you must be learning and living in spirit. Those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth, Jesus says. So what's really neat is Jesus is now going to re-engage with Nicodemus. And he, so he's talked about being born again. That makes me want to talk about being born again again. And then, but we're not going to get into that because I'm not going to have a pile of time. And I really want to say Nicodemus is grasping at straws and he's truly, really just trying to understand. So what has Nicodemus seen that drew him out to talk to Jesus at night? He's seen the miracles. He's, he's heard of everything that Jesus has been doing in those days. And Nicodemus is like, okay, we can testify of what we know. I am witnessing you do these miracles. There is no way you are doing this out of your own power, out of your own wisdom. You are, uh, you are called from God. So this is what we know Nicodemus has seen. And he is now drawn out to Jesus, and Jesus talks to him about being born again. We looked at the Valley of Dry Bones, and now we're going to dive in and see what Jesus is talking about here in verse 13 and 14. And, and that, that's where I'm at. We're fast-forwarding into verse 13, and it says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. What else do we know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees? We know that all of them are anticipating for the Messiah to come. That's not a secret. And everybody knows this. Everybody is waiting for the Messiah to come. So Jesus brings out a very, very bold point, and he says to him in verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Okay, Nicodemus is like, okay, right. The Messiah is the Son of God, and he's going to come out of heaven, meaning he has to descend from heaven, and then he can go back into heaven. So this isn't great wisdom or theology, but Jesus is just pointing out something very, very clear to Nicodemus. And then he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Okay, what does that have to do with the slice of bread? Why is Jesus now talking about Moses and this serpent? And what does that have to do with being born again? And what does that have to do with salvation and Jesus being the Son of God? Well, that, that means we need to rewind back into to Numbers. So in Numbers chapter 21 is where we read of the story of Moses raising up the serpent in the wilderness. So... Um, in the, in the essence of saving some time, I'm going to just kind of plow through this really quick. And we need to understand the context of what's going, going on. We know Israel is just a disobedient nation. 
So there's a lot of stuff that's gone on ahead of time of Numbers 21. So um, Israel has already declared mutiny. Not only Israel, Moses' wife. Moses' wife Miriam has gone up to Moses and challenged his authority. God struck her with leprosy. Get out of the camp. Didn't say it that mean, I'm sure, but out of the camp she goes, she comes back, and she's healed. Um, That's one thing that's happened. They've refused to go into the land of Canaan already, the promised land. And in that refusal to go, they were in these mountains, I think the mountains of Nahum, I think. I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyways, and they said, well, we need to go fight this fight for these people in the mountains so that we can actually reside here. Moses is like, this is not where we're supposed to be. Don't go fight. Israel goes and fights and gets annihilated. And they come running back, um, just beaten up and torn. So Israel's already been disobedient to God. They're being disobedient to Moses, going and fighting a fight that they haven't wanted. Miriam has challenged Moses. And here we go. Israel is now challenging Moses' authority again. And God is so frustrated, God opens up the earth and swallows them. The earth opened up and ate a pile of people. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. This has happened already. Okay, okay, so you think that would actually get them thinking, okay, maybe Moses is God's guy? Oh no, (laughs) here they come again. We're going to challenge Moses' authority again. So then this is what's happened is they take all these staffs from all the tribe's leaders. They put it into the temple, um, into the tabernacle, sorry, and Aaron's staff buds. Okay, they're like, okay, I think it's pretty clear. We're going to follow Moses. Okay, so you think that they've learned their lesson. Oh no, here we go again. So now they're being disobedient again, and God sends these snakes. That's, this is where we find ourselves in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Again, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version. And then they sat up. Then they set out for Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe for this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord. And yeah, sorry, we have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a, and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it up on a standard, and it came about that if, the serpent, if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Okay. What does, what does this mean? So what's really neat here, um, you, you see in verses um, 6 and 7, the people are actually starting to catch the drift. That, that God is sovereign and God is superior. So instead of challenging Moses, and now that these fiery serpents have come and all these people are dying, they're saying to Moses, they're running to Moses and say, okay, please intercede for us to God. They're recognizing a huge thing here. Okay, God sent the serpents. Please intercede for us that God may take away the serpents. This is what's really neat. So Moses intercedes, and God tells him to make a fiery serpent. What that fiery serpent literally means is just, it just means to make a serpent, use, use metal that's gone through fire, and you're going to have to mold it. That's what the fiery serpent means. It just means that he has to make a graven image. Really interesting. This isn't God's instruction for Moses to make this graven image of a snake, this bronze serpent, and put it up on a standard. Well, what a standard is, is a cross. So he took a stick and made a cross. He made this bronze fiery serpent, and he put this bronze serpent on the cross, stood it up amongst the people, and then whoever looked upon the serpent got healed. That's pretty neat. What does that sound like? 
Well, what's really interesting is why did Moses choose bronze? Bronze is a metal of judgment. So when they looked at this bronze serpent, they knew they were being judged. Judged for what? Well, they're bad mistakes. But if by faith they believed that this bronze serpent was going to heal them, they would be healed. So you see, couldn't God have made the snakes just slither away? Nobody's bitten again. Ha ha, thanks God. No. He did not take away that which killed them. Wow, that is amazing. I don't have time to go down that trail, but that is simply amazing. God did not take away the temptation. God did not take away the sin. God did not take away the consequence of sin. But what God did is he brought healing even though we mutinied against God. And if you looked upon the bronze serpent, then you would be healed. So this is the reference or the meaning of the bronze serpent. Now Jesus brings this up to Nicodemus. And this is really, really, um, really neat because look what Jesus says there. In, we're, we're back in John. In verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Look at Psalm 22. Look through the prophecies. The Son of Man is going to be sacrificed. It is talked about all over the place in the Old Testament. Now Nicodemus knows these things. He should know these things. But what Nicodemus does know for certain is the bronze serpent. So here's, here's where I found myself pulling at straws. And here's what I actually found was very uh, super humbling. It doesn't say it in the text, but a teacher of Israel knows, I want to say, every reference of bronze serpent throughout the Old Testament. Well, there's another reference to the Old Testament about the bronze serpent. Remember what I said about a graven image? Moses made this image, a bronze snake. If we turn into our Bibles, into 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 18. So this time frame, David is gone, and we, you read through the, the books of Kings and you get kings that are good, you get kings that are bad. You get kings that are good, you get kings that are bad. And Israel is good and Israel is bad. And here we find 2 Kings chapter 18, 1 through 5. This, this literally, this is where I want to say I, God took the wind out of my sails. Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, whoop, highlight. Zzz. I had to go back. When I read this text, I had to go back, and what did it just say? He did right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, let's keep reading. Remember, that's important. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. He removed high places, broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the fire. Asherah, he also broke, to pe broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the son of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Neshertan. I says, pardon? What did he just do? Rewind to verse 3. He did right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, he destroyed the bronze serpent that Moses had made that saved them. What does this have to do with the slice of bread? Well, it's the, the practical application of what I find, what we do in our Christian lives, is we look for a cure, the one cure to fix everything. We try to find a formula, whether it be morning devotions, whether it be evening singings, whether it be reading through the Bible through the year. We try to find these formulas that are going to fix the circumstances of life. Why was the bronze serpent made? It was to fix that specific sin. So they kept the bronze serpent. Yeah, okay, cool. But why did they keep the bronze serpent? Because it became their formula. 
and they burned incense to the bronze serpent. And they made this serpent a graven image. And they began to worship not the creator, but the creation. You see what I'm digging at? This is where I was just like, oh my word. I can't believe, I, I, I can't believe I'm reading this. And then I had to read back again just to make sure that it said that he did right in the sight of the Lord. Because how many times are we not caught up in the actions of finding the one cure that's going to fix everything? The one thing that is going to fix and mold our lives into a relationship that's better. This is what Israel had done. And Jesus brings up this bronze serpent to Nicodemus. And I can't help but imagine and think Nicodemus is thinking about King Hezekiah destroying the very thing that actually brought healing when they repented. And I wonder how many of us get caught up in this notion of being born again. And, and you know what? You don't have to go very far in, in, in even in amongst the churches that are local. Well, did you get fully immersed? Well, I wouldn't say you're baptized. And even if you try to church shop, and all of a sudden you're church shopping, you find a church that you really like, and they'll ask you about your baptism. And if you weren't fully immersed, they'll say the only way you become a member here is to be fully immersed in a baptism. Bronze serpent. We are now worshiping the things that we believe make us closer to God as opposed to actually worshiping God. This is the importance of actually understanding where our faith lies. This is the importance of seeing why Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in such a way that he brings up this bronze serpent. And, and you know what I find so amazing in, in all of this is that I found myself worshiping the bronze serpent. What's the one cure? What can I do in my life that no longer will circumstance make me have a bad day? I want that cure. I read a devotional this morning. It was, it was again, God has just been, I want to say, in our terminology, sucker punching me, taking the wind right out of me. Because the devotion that I read this morning, it talked literally about that. It talked about a swimmer and a surfer. And a swimmer who is going to swim out into the ocean has to fight that surf. And they are swimming and they are fighting that surf. But the surfer, <laughs> they're like, I find the most joy in riding the surf. What do we do as Christians when we are going through a hard time? We pray, God, get me through. And we're making these strokes and we're swimming against this surf and we're like, just God, stop the surf already. I just want to get through. And here comes a dude on a surfboard. Whoa, look at that guy. Whoa, he's got earrings, tattoos. But man, he looks like he's having fun. God, stop the surf. I can't fight and live this life anymore. Bronze serpents. Do we find ourselves trying to worship the cure as opposed to actually worshiping God? And we paint these pictures and we bring these labels upon people that we look at and, and we, we do all of these things and little do we realize when James talks about count it all joy when you face tribulations. Really? What does that mean? How can you run into a tribulation and counting it all joy? Well, are you still looking for the cure? Or are you completely dependent upon God for your identity no matter what life throws your way? Is there a cure? There is. It's Jesus. That's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, just like Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness and by faith did the poison of the snakes no longer kill them, they got bitten. You know what? 
You go through hard stuff. But just like by faith you believe my identity lies in Jesus Christ crucified and no matter what happens, I am loved. No matter what happens, I am secured. I am sealed until the day of redemption. And no matter what earth, my parents, my friends, my school, my job, my family, my church throws at me to persecute me, my identity is in Jesus Christ, my Lord. I found myself worshiping the serpent. I didn't even know it. There I am burning incense to this thing that I think is going to bring me salvation. Whether it be through reading, whether it be through devotions, whether it be through studying, whether it be through knowledge. You see, the thing about the Pharisees and the Sadducees is they were the smartest cats out there. But what did they worship? They worshiped their knowledge, not what their knowledge brought them to. The Son of God. And just like Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness and by faith, those who were still bitten. I think we've all been bitten. I think we all go through circumstances and we ask ourselves the questions, God, how do I get out? (laughs) You know what I'm going to tell you? Buy a surfboard. Ride the wave. Because you know what? The waves don't stop coming. That's the cure I was looking for. God, just stop the surf. (laughs) Take the moon away. I don't want the gravity to work on the tide anymore, God. These waves, this wind, and all this stuff is just annoying. You know what God told me? (laughs) Time for you to get a surfboard, buddy. Because you know what? The waves aren't going to stop. And as long as your identity is in trying to get through the waves and prove how strong you are of a swimmer, to to prove how strong your flesh is, to prove how strong you can be as a Christian in fighting everything I send your way. (laughs) Some waves will be small and you can swim through them pretty good. And you will actually boast up about yourself and think about how good of a Christian you can be. But some days I'm going to send a tsunami and there is no way you're going to swim out of that. But if you got a surfboard, you are going to go faster than you ever have. And you will receive way more joy, (laughs) way more pleasure riding that tsunami as opposed to trying to get through the tsunami. So I ask you the question, did you not know or have you been worshiping the brown serpent? I confess to you today that I am. I have been. Are we willing to make that same confession? And maybe you've, maybe I need to come to you and you can teach me. Because maybe you've experienced this and you realize, wait a minute, it's not about the formula. Because this is what the Pharisees and Sadducees were doing. It was about the formula. It was about their knowledge. It was about their wisdom. But they worshiped the wisdom, not what the wisdom was actually trying to teach them. Your identity lies in Jesus Christ. And just like that serpent was raised up, Jesus was raised up on a standard. Jesus was the judge of the world. And he died on that cross in order to forgive us all of our sins. I don't want to say often when we think of our sins being forgiven, that means that the trials and tribulations are gone because sin is paid for. But no. The harsh reality is is that even though sin is paid for, it doesn't mean that we still don't fall. And it doesn't mean we still don't strive to be free from sin. It doesn't mean that that stops. But I ask you... (laughs) Are you trusting in God to get you free from sin? Or are you molding out of fire your own bronze serpent in order to figure out the formula to how to get rid of sin in your life? If you are, go read Galatians chapter 3, 1 through 3. 
That's your homework. I like Jake. You started a homework thing. That's a really good thing. And see how much fruit is going to come out of you molding your own bronze serpent. God loves us. God loves you because God is love. Born again? What does that mean to be born again? What does that mean to have this life? Do you know what that means? Seek it out. Why did Jesus bring it up? Being born again. What died in the garden? What needs a resurrection life? When it says, when I tell you, just like he died, you died, what died on the cross? What does it mean to be born again? Water into wine. Oh, come on. (laughs) Here we go. Yeah, you know what? It's not about the wine. The water pots. And the fact that Jesus transformed this stuff and all of a sudden, this life, this, this ceremonial life of cleansing yourself from sin and from everything that the world has tainted you because, because the Jews were God's chosen people. And I must cleanse myself from the world. They worshiped the water pots. And Jesus turned it into wine. And then the servant, the master servant says, where did you get this wine? It is way better than that ceremonial cleansing. Water into wine is not an excuse to drink alcohol. Stop using it for that. It's about realizing you were worshiping a bronze serpent. Stop worshiping the bronze serpent. What what does all of this mean? Life after death. What does that mean? (laughs) What? You're going to tell me I got to live after I die? Well, anybody who's taken my class, and I think I've taught it from behind the pulpit, what is the simple definition of death? Separation. Where will you live once you leave the body you are in? Life after death. What does that mean? Where does that go? I am not trying to scare you into heaven. But I want you to, I wonder, what seals where your body, where your spirit goes when your body becomes a corpse and your spirit leaves? All of these questions, all of these things, what I want to tell you and what I close with, stop looking for the cure to circumstance. Start trusting and resting in the one who has said, no matter the circumstance, I know your pain. Let me walk with you through your pain. And when you begin to realize, go buy a surfboard. Because tribulations aren't going to stop coming. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this day, for your love and your life, for blessing us the way that you have. And uh, to be, again, brutally honest, I was a little bit nervous about um, making that confession of worshiping the bronze serpent, trying to find the cure outside of you, trying to find that formula. And I pray that we as a body of believers can unite in the likeness of wanting nothing more than to say, God, I now understand that bad circumstances don't have to stop coming. I'm going to stop praying that bad circumstances leave my life. And I'm going to start praying that you teach me how to surf. You teach me how to balance. And that's not the new cure. Please, (laughs) that's not the new cure, buying a surfboard. Yeah, you're going to go on Amazon. They're going to be all sold out next week. You watch. (laughs) 
but I pray that we learn to realize that being free of circumstance does not make us a better Christian. May you strengthen us. May you build us. And as we face more and more trials, and as we face even easy trials, I pray we depend upon you to get us through instead of the formulas we've already made to get us through the simple trials. I pray we become brave like King Hezekiah and we destroy the bronze serpent. And we let you live your life in and through us. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. The life that I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. You are truly an amazing God. Thank you so much for your love and your life, for keeping us and watching over us. In your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as the worship team is come on, coming on up to get ready to sing, I will close with the benediction, and you are free to go. Hebrews chapter 13, now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may go in peace with our Lord Jesus Christ and be the church people. Be the church.